Great and welcome everyone to the third webinar in the series on gene drives by our four organizations. Um, I won't name them all, but four organizations of independent scientists on the European level, ENSER, on the Swiss level, CSS, on the German level, the Federation of German Scientists, and on the French level, CNCPN. Um, We've had two webinars last week on what gene drives are, the technology, the science, and what they are being used for and the risks. Um, and this is the third one on the social aspects. And we'll have two more this Friday and next Tuesday on the ethical aspects and the regulatory aspects, respectively. This one, um, I'll introduce Tamara in a minute. The first two, if I summarize them very briefly, um, Ricardo Steinbrecher told us about the technology, telling us that gene drives really are genetic engineering for complete populations or even complete species to give them a new trait as a whole, so a whole group of animals or plants, um, or even to kill them at once. So it's a kind of um, modifying engineering evolution rather than individual animals or plants. Uh, she distinguished between natural and synthetic gene drives um, and she said actually that gene drives are a better name for the synthetic ones because uh, there is no natural system that will do anything that um, people want gene drives to do technologically. Um, so all synthetic gene drives are really engineered. They take natural components, but they engineer them to a great extent. The idea is not new, but CRISPR-Cas has made it possible. And that's why it's become interesting, become uh, taken a lot of attention recently. Um, then we had Mark Wells, both Ricarda and Mark out of Econexis in Oxford, Britain. Mark Wells told us about the applications, what they are used for gene drives. Um, they have been shown in the lab to work in insects and in fungi, molds, but it's still highly uncertain if they will work in mammals like mice and rats and starlings, and even more uncertain if they will work in plants at all. Nonetheless, he discussed a few um, potential applications. The one that has progressed furthest is in certain mosquitoes for suppressing malaria or for eradicating malaria. Uh, he also discussed some of the risks um, and the biggest risks are ecological. Um, we really have, have no idea what will happen if we put a gene drive in nature and it hasn't happened yet. They've only been tested in the lab. The problem the big dilemma with gene drives is that you can't really test them because in order to test them, you have to release them. And that is a factual exploitation in the wild. That's not to test anymore. So that's a big dilemma. Um, we don't know anything about what they will do to animals or plants of the same species or related species when they are released. Um, we don't even control what the technology will do in the targeted species or population because the basic technology CRISPR-Cas is not very reliable. It has a lot of un untarget, non-target effects, uh, unintended effects in the organism in which it is applied. And of course gene drives are potentially irreversible even though secondary gene drives are being tested for reversing or compensating the effects of the initial gene drive. Or that is actually a confirmation that they are irreversible, um, technically. But um, there are many, many uncertainties. That's what Mark Wells stressed. Um, there, are also, there is also clear military interest, although um, 
the military, particularly the American military, who puts a lot of money into this, uh, is not explicitly stating, of course, what kind of weapon they would like to construct with it. But the fact that they are interested says something about the potential of gene drives to be used for military purposes. Um, for funders, investors, there are no names of big companies known yet. Uh, most of the money comes from the American army, for one thing I already mentioned, and also from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I think I shouldn't say much more about the first two webinars. Um, for you, uh, if you have questions uh, during the webinar, please fill them in in the Q&A box. At the bottom of your window, in the middle, you find a Q&A button. If you move your cursor there, if you press it, you can write a question there. And at the end of the webinar, at the end of the talk, sorry, um, when Tamara has finished her talk, uh, we shall deal with all the questions and answer them one by one. Please add your name if you write a question. If you, if you registered with your name, it will be there automatically. But if you haven't, please add your name to the question because we will only answer um, non-anonymous questions. You may wonder why we keep your webcam switched off. That is simply to save energy. All digital activities take a tremendous lot of energy and we want to save some energy. Then this webinar, like the other ones, is being recorded and will be put online, not immediately afterwards. It may take some time before it appears online. I don't know how long yet um, because webinars are new to us, so the recordings are also new to us and we're working on them, but it may, be ta it may take a week or so. But keep an eye on the website where they were announced, genedrives.ch, and you'll see it appearing there. That leaves me just to introduce Tamara Leprecht. Welcome, Tamara. Thank you for doing this. Um, Tamara is, Thank you for having me. Tamara is Executive Secretary of Critical Scientists Switzerland one of the organizers, uh, actually the initiator of the Gene Drive project from which these webinars result. The Gene Drive project ran in 2018 and 19. We published a report from it last year. She is also senior scientist at Gene Watch UK and she had a big part in the chapter in the report on the social aspects of gene drives. She has a master of science in ecology and evolution from the ETH in Zurich, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And with that, I'd like to give you the word, Tamara, please. Thank you very much, Dietrich. I will try sharing my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes, but press full screen somewhere, yeah. From start. That's so, it. here we are. <laughs> so, a welcome from my side. Thank you very much, Dietrich, for this nice recap and introduction. And yes, I'm happy that so many people joined today's webinar. I know that probably many of you um, had many webinars in the last couple of weeks and Hopefully soon we will be able to do that in person again. So today, in this third webinar of this series, we will look at the social aspects of gene drives. We'll speak about promises, precaution, and public engagement. First, I have a quick introduction. I have to minimize my videos, otherwise I don't see my own slides moment. Okay, so if we have a new technology like gene drives, what we have to do is to assess uh, risk and benefits, short and long term risk and benefits, not only for the environment, but also for society. And as Diedrich has already mentioned in the recap, but not, not everybody might have heard that uh, for people that joined later. 
gene drives pose a big challenge for technology assessment. Because on the one hand, we first have to develop the technology and to conduct experiments in order to fully be aware of all the impacts the technology can have. But on the other, one, other hand, it is tricky to do a release without knowing the risks first, because then we must potentially accept risks and they might be difficult or even impossible to reverse. So what can we do in the case of gene drives to anticipate anticipate risks in advance. What we can do and what has been done and is being done are controlled methodologies such as modeling work and lab experiments. And this gives us very valuable insight. So we have seen um, what can be done, where problems are, a lot more research has to be done, of course. But the emphasis here lies on the word controlled. So by definition, controlled methods will never be able to reflect all the complexities and unpredictabilities of a real world situation. So we have this new technology and we want to know risks and benefits, but there is no final product yet and no releases yet. And it's hard to know what will happen if we do such a release. Okay, now it doesn't work oh, like this. Okay, sorry, I have to try this out first. So in our chapter of the Gene Drive report, we argue that we should change the premise. So in star, instead of starting with, develop, with the development of a new technology, and then think about what problems it could solve and assess risk and benefits as good as possible in order to decide whether or not to use the technology. We should put the de definition of a problem in the center and then look what possible means do we have to solve it or could we develop to solve it. Then have a precautionary assessment of all the alternatives before we set research and development priorities. So in today's webinars, we want to analyze how these two approaches affect empowerment and inclusion of society in decision making. But before we get to that, here a short overview. First, we will look a little bit at the context, how research and development is funded and patented today. And we will speak about hype that appears about new technologies and how that can influence what solutions are being pursued and which maybe not. Then we will speak about complexities and uncertainties and about precaution before we come to the topics of fully informed consent and genuine public engagement. So first to the context. With the decrease of public um, funding of science that we have observed in the last decades, university had more and more pressure to diver diversify their sources of income. So we have seen an increased reliance also on private investments. Today, it is pretty common that there is a tighter relationship between universities and private companies. And with the change of law that we have first seen in the US in 1980, um, universities were able to patent their in-house inventions. So before that, patents, um, inventions made with public money belonged to the federal government, but it became possible in the 1980s for university to not only patent their inventions but also to license or sell them to private company and these company could then try to commercialize these um, inventions and make money from it. So this is called um, a technology transfer and it did not only uh, increase the relationship between universities and industry but also between 
individual researchers and industry. So today, uh, researchers even get incentives to spend their time with technology transfer activities. In some cases, they are allowed to spend time. Not researchers themselves uh, co-found companies that commercialize inventions. We have seen this, for example, with CRISPR-Cas. Voilà. Um, yes, do you hear me? Yes, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, your sound is interrupted now and then. Um, it's imperfect. It might okay. be better to switch off your webcam. People will see your screen, that's no problem, but they won't see your face. That's okay. No, no, you can, you, can leave, you can leave the screen as it was. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, just I don't see my webcam and I don't see where to turn Bottom, bottom left-hand corner. It says start video. Just press that button. Yeah. What? Sorry? Yeah. Ah. I just I didn't. for you, Tamara. Oh, she did it. He did. You're my hero. <laughs> so do I have to repeat anything or should I just go on? Just your last sentence. Okay. If, if you remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So I was just talking about that researchers themselves can make profit from their own patents, even though the patents belong to the universities, but they might get royalties from the inventions and thus can have an interest in promoting their own patents. And that is obviously a conflict of interest. So with this development, researchers started to shift their focus of work more on technologies that can be patented and commercialized. And other research that may not be suitable for developing patents and products may not be um, developed in the same way, even though they may have um, very good benefit for society. What we have also seen is that these changes in policies gave rise to different technologies, for example, biotechnology. Biotechnology also made it possible for the first time to patent living organisms. And that in turn was a huge incentive to invest a lot more money in the field of biotechnology. So it is not astounding that with these shifts we have seen more and more hype about new technologies to appear in funding applications, for example, but also in scientific literature, because sometimes funders even want researchers and universities to tell them what the actual social benefit of their work will be well in advance. So overpromising in order to re uh, secure research funding is today almost routine. So for example, to say that a cure is just around the corner if there was only some more millions invested. Okay, but what are the claims made in the case of gene drives? First of all, I want to repeat again, we have heard that from Diederik, that today there are no field trials being conducted yet with gene drives. So claims and promises made today are based on lab and modeling work and not on real life experience. And what we read often in media, as well as scientific publications or patent applications, is that gene drives can have valuable practical applications. For example, and you probably all know about this, and that we could fight vector-borne diseases such as malaria and Lyme disease with gene drives and thereby reduce human suffering or that we could control invasive species such as rodents on islands and thereby safe threatened species. 
or also that we could reverse pesticide resistance in insects or herbicide resistance in weeds. Now, I want to look at some examples here from media headlines. What do they say? So one says, powerful gene drive can quickly change an entire species. And similarly, another one says, the CRISPR machines that can wipe out entire species. So in both cases, the promise is that with gene drives, we can either change or eliminate entire species. And the hype here is really in the word can, because as said before, we don't have proof yet that the, that the technology will work and will work as intended. So it's premature to say what is really going to happen. Also a big claim is the term entire species because that implies that not only will the technology work but it will work in indefinitely or until the very last member of a species is altered. And I also find the word quickly uh, quite the claim here. But um, even more interesting, I find this other headline from the Vox article that says a genetically modified organism could end malaria and save millions of lives if we decide to use it. So not only does it claim here that the technology will work and it will save millions of lives, even though we don't know that as of yet, but there's also this moral imperative that it's our responsibility to save these lives. And if we don't want the technology to, do, to go ahead, we are obviously against saving these lives. Even though, again, we don't know yet that the technology would work. And we also don't know if maybe another solution would save more lives quicker. So these media headlines already form the perception of a technology in society very early on. Now I want to look at an example from a funding recommendation report. This is from the Harvard University Effective Altruism Student Group and is made for philanthropists. And underlined in red, they say, Although the initial cost to research and develop gene drive systems are high, once developed, it offers an incredibly cost-effective means of combating infectious diseases, as the gene drive is capable of spreading itself with little additional cost or human intervention. So they say that the costs are high, but that's no problem because the result will not only be effective, which we don't know that it will be, but also cost effective. And I find it an interesting claim because in the end, we don't know if we will have to do several releases. Um, we probably have to do control and maybe if something goes wrong, intervention. Then we have here an example from a patent application. This is a famous patent from Kevin Eswelt, inventor of CRISPR-based gene drives from 2015. And under example six application, they say, the gene drives described herein have particular practical utility in the eradication of infectious diseases and the control of invasive species. So I find it interesting that an, at a an very early stage in a patent application, they already refer to what are the practical, what is the practical utility of the invention. Now I want to stay for a minute with Kevin Eswelt. He has a research group at the MIT Media Lab in Massachusetts. They are called Sculpting Evolution. And just that name shows how confident they really are in what their research can achieve and that they are bigger than evolution. 
but that's just as a side note. So on their website, they say, the problem with current CRISPR-based gene drive systems is that they can spread indefinitely. That means releasing a handful of organisms could eventually affect every population of the target species throughout the world. It is unclear how these systems can be safely tested. So I agree with that. I said that in the beginning, it's unclear how we can safely test these systems. But even though they portray the potential global spread as a problem, there is still quite some hype in these sentences because they do not question that the gene drive would actually spread indefinitely. There's again the word can. They also say that it only needs a handful of organisms uh, so that in the end we reach every member of the target species. For me that's quite an exaggeration but then they have the, the solution to this problem which is their daisy drive systems. So daisy drives are as you have heard last week probably another a version of gene drives that can only affect local environments. But we have to very clearly say that this is a theoretical mathematical concept. It has not, not even been tested in the lab. So the interesting thing here is that certain terms are already manifested even though a technology may not exist. As you see below, they say on the one hand we have global drive and what they mean by that is just a, a normal gene drive concept and global drives as they say have fast spread are indefinite and are global and on the other hand we have the daisy drives that also have fast spread but are only local. So Opening these terms in society at the same time they establish um, a feeling of more control and less risks if we decide to use daisy drives instead of the I say conventional gene drives. And Kevin Eswelt has patented these, this concept of daisy drives. Um, this is a patent application from 2018 where they say that daisy drives can be used to address otherwise intractable ecological problems with a level of safety inherent in their design that reduces or eliminates a likelihood of global effects as occurs for conventional G-drive organisms. So again, we have that claim that conventional gene drive organism will have a global effect and now the daisy drives would be more safe and lead to more control but very interestingly they even claim that they can be used to address otherwise intractable ecological problems as if this was the only possible solution to these problems. So we have seen that how research is funded and patented today can lead to unrealistic claims about what researchers can deliver. In the case of gene drives, we have seen several examples from media, scientific publication and patent application that already claim social benefits or environmental benefits, but that are, that are still premature. We have seen that claims and promises made can form perception of a technology and that the very language and term, terms used, such as global drives or local drives, um, are already established in the society before a technology actually exists. So the problem with all of this is that it can lead to overstretched expectations of what science and technology can achieve not only within the public, but also with investors and policy makers. The examples mentioned 
uh, convey the impression that once this technology is re released, it will work rapidly, predictably as intended, and thereby being not only a sensible solution, but possibly the only solution to certain problems. So gene drives appear to be already a proven reality, a known working tool in the toolbox. And thereby, it conveys the impression that it is our duty to progress the technology. Because if we don't, then we are against saving lives or saving threatened species. And that is a very difficult basis for discussion. Because what to answer to this? It may thereby close down public debate about what are the best ways of developing knowledge in order to tackle certain problems. And another is that we can neglect alternatives if we only speak about the one solution. And that can lead to opportunity costs if we pursue a solution that is costly and that is uncertain and that is risky and might in the end not be applied and therefore neglect other solutions. Another point I wanted to mention is that by focusing on such technological fixes to a problem, we can neglect addressing underlying causes. In that case, by focusing on the mosquito and how to get rid of it with a technological fix, we can neglect addressing inefficient healthcare systems, lack of access to healthcare, or lack of access to tap water, for example, and just deficient infrastructure in general. So we have um, spoken about claims made about gene drive technology and applications and why they may still be premature. Now I would like to speak a little bit about uncertainty. And I know this may be a little bit of repetition from last week's webinar, so I will only mention a few examples here. So one big question mark is the development of resistance. There are there is lab evidence showing that resistance to CRISPR-based gene drives may actually evolve pretty quickly. There is also some evidence showing how such development, uh, development of resistance could be overcome, but in the end we don't know what would happen in the world. There's not only the issue of biological resistance evolving, but there could, for example, also behavioral resistance evolve. So in the case of the sterile insect technology, there was some evidence that female mosquitoes actually avoid mating with sterile males from the lab. So what we learn from this is that the whole ecosystem may evolve and that there are many uncertainties. There's, then there's the question mark of species interaction. There are approximately 70 Anopheles species that can transmit malaria. Not all of them are major vector species, but they can transmit malaria. And how they interact is complicated. Um, populations are dynamic and adaptable because of quick reproduction times and evolution. And so it's hard to say how many species we would actually need to transform in order to have an impact on diseases like malaria. In, it's probably not going to work if we just focus on the one species, Anopheles gambiae. And if we manage to reduce the number of these species, then another question is what happens to the vacated ecological niche? Could another vector species move in? And even if a non-vector species moves in, what are the consequences of that? So there's a lot of questions there. And in the past, we have had 
quite a number of examples where exactly these uncertainties have been overlooked and have led to quite some problems. So, for example, with genetically modified insect resistant crops, today we have big problems of resistance of target pests against these crops. And before that, when the crops still worked fine and target pests died, we saw a lot of problems of secondary pests move in and become, they were prior just minor pests and then they became really damaging crop pests. So we should learn from these experiences and look at all those question marks with care and in advance. Another question is, will gene drive seen work in mammals? I think that was also discussed last week. Just shortly, there is some um, evidence that gene drives may be inefficient in mice. And even though the authors couldn't exactly tell why they were seeing what they were seeing, they were pretty sure that we won't have, um, won't be able to soon eradicate mammals from islands. And then another question, which is very, very rarely discussed, if at all discussed, is just the practical implication of how many gene drive rodents would we really have to release over frame, time frame and how many re releases would we have to do in order for the technique to be efficient and since rodents gene drive rodents would not only mate and die but they would also eat hunt and walk around we have to consider what damage they cause in the meantime to the target uh, to the species we want to save from extinction but also to the ecosystems so i will not go into more details about complexities and uncertainties for those who have missed last week's webinars there's much more on ecological risks in the second chapter of the gene drive report but nevertheless i want to mention that there are many complexities and uncertainties and emphasize that this is why it's important to go about these technologies with a precautionary approach so a precautionary approach means that we should have a cautious attitude towards risk and take preemptive measures to avoid harm. We should consider the implication of incomplete knowledge, such as ignorance and uncertainty. And the precautionary principle in promotes a scientific scientific pathway that does embrace complexity and uncertainty with less humility with more humility and less hubris and the precautionary principle fosters a more transparent and democratic decision making now as we have seen with gene drives there are uncertainties and a release may have possible irreversible effects and for that reason, the precautionary principle does apply to gene drive research and development. Now, there are quite some critics of the precautionary principle, and they say that it blocks innovation. However, there is no evidence to support that claim. The precautionary principle only restricts innovation in some questionable technologies. But on the other hand, it creates space to foster innovation in other direction. So precaution is about steering innovation, not about blocking it, as innovation can take many different pathways. And these pathways may not be the ones endorsed today by industry and corporate interests so that's probably why they say it blocks innovation but as we've seen innovation can take many different pathways and these should all be part of the debate early on when research and development priorities are set 
and not only at the stage of the release. So we also argue that the precautionary principle should already be applied to research and also not only at the stage of a release. So some of you might know the 2016 report by the US Nat National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. They actually say that it might be useful to apply the precautionary principle at the stage of an experimental release because this is where the uncertainties and risks come in. And while this is certainly true, we still argue that the precautionary principle should be applied earlier at the stage of research because it can also be questioned whether it is necessary to develop such technologies in the first place by applying the precautionary principle to research. And in that way, we may um, save resources um, by applying it early on. Okay, so we have spoken about promises, we have spoken about precaution, and now I want to speak a little bit about prior and informed consent. So what do communities that, where an experiment may take place, how do they know about an experiment, and what kind of say do they have in whether or not the experiment should go forward? For medical research, so for example, the development of gene drives for malaria control, we have the Helsinki Declaration. And the Helsinki Declaration requires fully informed consent of all potentially affected parties before. And for non-medical research, so for example, the development of gene drives for control of invasive species, the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2018 adopted a decision that requires prior and informed consent of potentially affected indigenous people and local communities. But what does informed consent mean? So obviously it means that potentially affected parties need to know know about an experiment before it takes place, need to know about the aims and methods, and need to know about risks and benefits. And as explained before, in the case of gene drives, it is very hard to know and anticipate risks in advance. So it's also difficult to really get informed consent in advance. But informed consent also means that affected parties should be informed about sources of funding, any possible conflict of interest and institutional affiliation. So it's important to know about experiments, but it's also important to know who is doing the informing. Now, with gene drives, we don't have um, an example of an application yet, but we can look at the processes followed for the releases of GM mosquitoes. So no gene drives have been released yet and there are no applications to do so right now, but there have been GM mosquitoes without gene drives have been re released uh, since over 10 years. And the main company that is doing these releases is the UK-based company Oxitec. Oxitec has done releases in the Cayman Islands, in Malaysia, Brazil and Panama. And last year they were joined by Target Malaria who made a first release of GM mosquitoes in Burkina Faso. The ultimate goal of Target Malaria is to in the end have a solution with gene drive mosquitoes but the release they did last year was with sterile male GM mosquitoes. 
So for exporting live GM organisms from the EU, EU for an open release elsewhere, one is legally required to provide a prior, prior transboundary notification that tells about the intent of the experiment, as well as a publicly available risk assessment that meets EU standards. And by meeting EU standards, um, it also has to take into account the precautionary principle because that's a fundamental principle of the EU. Now, but what do we find in reality? So avoidance of transboundary notifications and lack of publicly released risk assessments are major issues we find with the company Oxitec. In fact, Oxitec has never published a risk assessment that fulfills European standards before conducting one of their experimental releases. And if we eventually get to see um, a risk assessment, important risk endpoints might be missing. For example, the impact on competitor species, competitor species that might also be vector species as well as the impact on non-target organism by conducting field trials are uh, missing and discussion of socioeconomic aspects. Another problem that we see is a lack of public consultation or public consultation only with a very short notice. For example, last year, the company Oxitec applied to the US Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, for a release of GM mosquitoes in the US. And the EPA only gave one month notice to send in comments. So this is a very short time, given that you might not immediately know about the consultation process, and then when you do know about it, you have to collect your arguments and have scientific references for them in the best case. And that takes time. So even though in that example, there was this one notice, over 30,000 com comments were sent in and virtually all of them were asking not to go ahead with the experiment. Non regarding, just uh, in May, the EPA gave green light for the experiment. Um, yes, but what about target malaria? So target malaria claims to hold itself to higher standards, but we've also seen with the release in Burkina Faso that there was no um, transboundary notification and that target malaria conducted its own risk assessment without reference to the required standards and with heavy reliance on their own data and data that is unpublished and unavailable to the public. So we see a problem of untransparency and that institution proposing a release can have a lot of control over how risk assessments are being conducted. Another problem is that the countries where such a release of GM mosquitoes will take place may lack appropriate legislation um, for that. So for example, in the Cayman Islands, when they did the first relief, release of gene mosquitoes there, they didn't really have a legislation, enacted legislation yet on live GMOs. But one could also argue whether or not the legislation in the US is appropriate. So at the moment, uh, gene mosquitoes are regulated under the EPA's process for registering insecticides. So Live organisms are treated as basically a chemical and whether or not that makes sense or is the best way to do this is debatable. And that is why we argue that best practice would be 
to first develop guidance for an adequate risk assessment and that this would be done by the regulators and not by the institutions proposing a release. And that in a second step, this guidance would be subject to public consultation. And only afterwards should companies uh, conduct risk assessment that follows these guidances and again their risk assessment should be subject to public consultation with enough time to send in comments. Now Oxitec can also conduct public engagement activities where they go out to communities and speak to communities, something that is very very important but also, unfortunately, we see some problems there. One problem, again, is the exaggeration of effectiveness, that people are being told that there is an existing solution. So, for example, in Brazil, Oxitec had a ban with an advertisement jingle, and the jingle said something like, um, this is a friendly, friendly mosquito, he is the solution, let him into your house, he will fight dengue. And given that one has to see that what these institutions are doing are experimental releases. So, for example, they want to know how far do the mosquitoes fly, how is their mating behavior, etc. These are experimental releases and they are not meant to have a real impact on the transmission on the disease yet. So telling people that there is this solution is um, quite misleading and actually in that way public engagement can be used as a means to publicize the technology, which should obviously not be the case. Another problem we have observed is that in some cases, even though the promises made are, are relating to health benefits, there are usually no medicine or public health expert presence in these public engagements. Usually there are biologists, geneticists or entomologists present. And again, an obvious problem is that these activities are led by the institutions proposing the release. And so there is a conflict of interest to promote the technology and to gain acceptance. So obviously these in institutions want to gain acceptance and so there's also this problem of power imbalance. And I find this an important aspect of this discussion and want to go into a bit more detail about power imbalances. So gene drives are a form of north-south technology transfer. That means we have a technology that was developed in labs in the global north and are being transferred and applied possibly in the global south. And that means that people where public engagement takes place may be vulnerable due to poverty and lack to access to healthcare. And that they may um, agree to an experiment not because of their personal feelings towards the technology, but because they, there are hopes of some form of compensation. So, for example, there has been a study in Mali with interviewees saying that they would agree to an experiment with gym mosquitoes because they basically hope to get a hospital in return. And in Burkina Faso, local people um, joined research activities of target malaria. And what they did, for example, different things but one example is that they expose their lower legs for hours to collect, collect life biting female mosquitoes from their bodies and they got paid something like 70 cents an hour. So we see this power imbalance there because of poverty and lack of access to healthcare. 
Another power imbalance is the one between experts and local people. So we have seen that local people actually have quite some doubts and question if the technology will actually work. But it is difficult if you may lack resources and expertise to really contest claims of efficacy and to raise doubt that is not immediately dismissed by experts. Another power imbalance can be between the scientists promoting the technology and local scientists. There has been another study in Nigeria where a lot of something like 160, 170 local scientists were interviewed and actually more than 80% of them were against releasing GM mosquitoes in their country. And then sadly, there's also an imbalance between men and women. So there's also quite some evidence that in some cases, women don't have a lot of say in these processes. Now, power imbalances may affect who is asked for their input to decision, who has information, also what kind of information, and most importantly, what choices people are actually able to make and finally what decisions are taken. Now, what is genuine public engagement? So first of all, citizens should be seen as subjects and not as objects of the discourse. That means they should not simply be given information and get the opportunity to speak but they should have a genuine opportunity to shape agendas and affect decisions. Then public engagement and public debate should not be framed by unrealistic promises, but instead it should accept incomplete knowledge and complexities. And genuine public engagement should be problem-led instead of technology-led. So I come back to the slide from the beginning. So instead of presenting people with a proposed technological solution to a predefined problem to which they may voice their concern, public engagement should happen at a very beginning so people should first of all be asked what their problem problems are what their needs are so public en engagement should not only come in when the technology already exists and when the question is whether or not we want to apply it but it has to come in at the very beginning when funders and researchers come together to define a problem and set research and development priorities. So the public should have a say there already. Unfortunately, discussion of what kinds of projects should be considered for a funding call is rarely open to the engagement of the affected public. I'm going back. Okay, we had that. So genuine public engagement should also enable choice. That means that the engaged public should be presented with all the possible alternatives and should be informed um, about all the pros and cons of these alternatives in order for them to make an informed choice. And it should also allow for different kinds of expertise, opinions and viewpoints to come in. So not only of the institutions proposing a release, but also of some critics and minorities, etc. Finally, public engagement must not pay for acceptance that aims to prevent controversy by fostering trust and provide, providing justification. So it must not be conducted with the premise that the, 
technology will be accepted and it, that it may just need some modifications and changes to reach that goal. But instead, genuine public engagement must allow for the option, option of rejecting a particular technology or approach and instead choosing alternative approaches. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation.